Hi, welcome to everyone. This is the Back to Basics webinar on the role of evaluation in improving results for children and youth with disabilities. Um, my name is Tamara Nimkoff, and uh, I coordinate technical assistance related to evaluation for the IDA Data Center. Um, I also want to just thank my IDC colleagues, Beth Harrison and Vera Straparantier, um, for their help in contributing to this webinar content. And um, as people are joining in, a couple of just quick uh, housekeeping items. Um, as Sophia has noted in our chat box, um, everyone has been muted just to preserve audio quality. If you have any questions, please use the chat box. And please remember that the send to says all participants so that everyone can see it. Um, Sophia will monitor the box just throughout and will let me know if a, a question or comment comes in along the way. Um, but also we'll use the chat box for interacting a little bit later on during this call. And so that will be important for you to be able to share with your fellow participants. Um, so if you have attended uh, any of our prior Back to Basics webinars, um, you know that um, these webinars are really about fundamentals. Um, we have presented on the basics of certain APR indicators and data collections, for example. And today's webinar um, will also cover the basics. But instead of covering a particular indicator or data collection, I'm going to discuss the basics of evaluation. And I'll provide some very beginning level information on the evaluation process and discuss the role that evaluation plays in informing uh, special education or early intervention services um, in order to improve results. And um, I also want to mention that this um, recording, um, or pardon me, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available along with the PowerPoint slides from this presentation. So um, that will be available to you. Okay, so I just wanted to note um, who all is in the room. Um, to get started, I want to acknowledge just the wide variety of registered participants that we had. Um, people noted their current job or role, and this has covered a wide range from Part C and Part B data managers and directors to implementation coordinators, um, program policy managers, and more. And I also noted that the um, length of time that participants have served in their position at the time when they registered ranged from one week to 27 years. Um, so welcome to all. I hope that each of you find uh, something of value in this presentation. Um, my goals for uh, this hour are that you will gain an understanding of the basic components of evaluation and that um, you will have a chance to consider evaluation as a powerful tool for informing services and for supporting positive results in your own state. In order to achieve this, um, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to discuss the role of evaluation and uh, how evaluation can help state staff know if activities are resulting in intended outcomes. We're going to talk about the power of data and um, you know, how staff can leverage the multitude of data that are collected. I'm going to review four key components of the evaluation process and share a couple of examples along the way um, of evaluation process related to uh, Part B and Part C. Um, then you'll get a turn. I will ask you to share your own ideas relevant to your state and situation of how you could apply each component of the evaluation process. And lastly, I'll just review some quick tips on what makes for a good evaluation process. And truthfully, thinking about the variety of roles represented among participants in the call today, um, it, I really believe that this indicates um, the wide-ranging relevance of this topic. And rightly so, because we are all in um, the business of working towards the best results 
of um, possible for our children and youth and families. And the results that we want to see should drive the actions that we take. This is reflected in, in the shift in our work towards results-driven accountability that really frames our work. Um, RDA is really about targeting work towards uh, and investments to um, best support intended results. Uh, the results that you want to achieve drive the actions, the activities, policies, procedures, practices uh, at state and local levels. RDA really requires us to ask ourselves what improved outcomes we want to see and what actions we need to take to get to those improved outcomes. This is the planning process in RDA, and truthfully, we are all engaged in this planning, whether formally or informally, just through decisions every day that are made to enact programs or revise policies or update procedures. But how do we know that these actions that we're taking are resulting in intended outcomes? How do we direct or target our work to have the most positive results? This is the role of evaluation. So in very formal terms, perhaps, evaluation is defined here, the systematic collection, analysis, and dissemination of information in order to make decisions. So really, in other words, evaluation is about taking stock, and the point of evaluation is to learn and then do something based on what you learn. Evaluation is a fundamental learning tool within RDA as it informs our actions and supports those intended results. So all of us familiar with the state systemic improvement plan, um, indicators C11 and B17, certainly know that evaluation has a very explicit role in that process. As part of the SIP, we're assessing progress being made in implementation of activities and the impact that those activities are having on our intended results. But there is a lot of work in your state that is about improving results for children and youth with disabilities. And that truly is a singular focus of all of your work, not just restricted to the SIP. So my presentation today is about how evaluation is a tool at your disposal that can really inform all areas of this work. Within your state, and in your local entities, you have access to powerful information in the form of data. Now, you have invested heavily in processes and systems for capturing data. Um, I would not be surprised if right now staff are in the midst of collecting reporting data around Part C or Part B indicators. Um, but behind these data are actual programs, policies, procedures, and practices that are occurring at the local level or within the district and across your state organization or lead agency. Behind state indicator data, just for example, are interventions and service delivery models, child find procedures, supervision and monitoring systems and policies, uh, technical assistance procedures and guidance being developed and disseminated. So evaluation is truly a mechanism to leverage the data that you have. You use data for required documentation and reporting, but those data generated by the systems and processes you have in place can also be used to support improvement, to make decisions about resource allocation, for example, to target areas for improvement in your programs and your services. So how do we go about learning for improvement? So evaluation truly does not need to be overly complex or burdensome. I'd like to break it down, the process, into just four key components. One, link your evaluation activities, excuse me, link your activities to the outputs and the outcomes you expect as a result. Two, form evaluation questions, what you want to know about what you're doing. Three, Collect and analyze data to find answers to your questions. Four, plan to do something with what you learn, to use and strategically share what you find. 
Let's look at each component. First, what are you doing and what results do you expect? Identify the activity, the initiative or program or policy <clears throat> that you will be doing or perhaps already have in place in your state, in your region, in your locality. Determine the outputs that you expect. These are the direct observable evidence that the activity has been completed as planned. And identify your intended outcomes. These are statements of the benefit or change that you expect as a result of the completed activities. You likely know what results you expect to be occurring from activities. I mean, after all, you do things for a reason, but perhaps you haven't actually articulated these or shared the assumptions that you have driving your work uh, among your team or with relevant stakeholders. This is a way to do that. I want to look at a quick example of this first component. Let's say there's a state education agency who supports implementation of the Taxonomy for Transition Programming framework in three regions of the state. So this is their activity. So the successful completion of this activity as planned will be evidenced by cross-agency training and support for the framework implementation within each of these regions. Those are the necessary outputs to know that the activity occurred as planned. But why are they implementing this? Well, the SEA staff believe that students from the regions implementing the framework will have more successful post-school outcomes. This is their intended outcome. Here's another way to organize this component. I'm pausing, pardon me, I have a terrible cold and I'm trying not to cough when I present. It's winter in North Carolina. So consider a logic model. It's a way to graphically display how activities are linked to outputs and out outcomes. Really, a logic model can be used to clarify the relationship among any elements of a project or even an evaluation plan. It shows how they're connected. This is a very simple model that just shows the activity and outcome and out, uh, pardon me, activity, output, and outcome statements from our example. <clears throat> Using a logic model can help for both implementation but also evaluation planning because you can reference back to a logic model for creating evaluation questions and identifying data collection and analysis, which are driven by these intended outputs and outcomes identified here. Let's look at second component, form evaluation questions. Your evaluation questions are really what you want to know, what you need to know to determine that things are proceeding as expected and if the intended outcomes are occurring. Think about what you want to learn on both process and outcomes. Process questions are things about how's it going? Are we successfully accomplishing our activities? Are we doing what we intended to do? Outcomes-based questions are what good did it do? What are the results? Did we accomplish our goal? Let's look back at our secondary transition program example. Remembering that the intended outcome for the SEA staff was that students from framework regions would have more successful post-school outcomes than students from other non-implementing framework regions. So the SEA staff have identified two broad questions that are of interest to them. Do former students from framework regions have higher enrollment in post-secondary education and higher competitive employment rates than those from non-framework regions? 
was region fidelity of framework implementation associated with the outcomes we observed. How will you know what you want to know? This is component three, collecting and analyzing data. The evaluation questions that you want to answer will guide what data you collect and how you analyze it. Identify information that you need to answer those questions. What or perhaps who are the sources of data and what are the tools or measures that are needed to gather the data? Consider what data that you may already be collecting and have access to and what data might be needed that are new. How you analyze those data that you collect or access. Now, analysis really is simply exploring data to gain meaningful insight, to assess progress, to understand, or to improve something. The way that you analyze data depends on the question that you want to answer and the type of data that you have. Data analysis can be very simple. It can involve sorting, counting, ordering as a simple ways to make meaning out of evaluation data. Or analyses can be more complex. You could use statistical tests, for example, to determine relationships among data. But the important point is not how complicated your analysis is. It's that the analysis that you choose is appropriate to the question you want to answer and the data that you have. Let's look at this step in our example. In order to answer the two evaluation questions that they have, the SEA staff collects data related to the effective provision of the cross-agency professional development. For example, they may do this via survey and training data. They collect data from a framework implementation fidelity tool. They collect data from the indicator B14 database which um, includes data on post-school outcomes. And all of these need to be disaggregated by region in order to answer the questions that they have. To analyze the data, the staff are going to determine the level of framework implementation by each region using the tool. They may count the number of former students from each framework region enrolled in post-secondary education and competitively employed. They would compare the student post-school outcomes between the framework and non-framework regions. And they may examine the potential relationship between framework implementation fidelity and all of this again by region. But what do we do with the data that we gather and examine in this way? Component four in the evaluation process is really having a plan for sharing and using your evaluation results. Evaluation findings, like we've just described, can be very motivational. Being able to see progress, for example, even if it's small, can provide reinforcement to those who are implementing an activity. You can use evaluation findings to improve your implementation of an activity and to assess your progress towards a goal. This includes thinking about how staff and stakeholders communicate and use data along the way. So how can you complete this feedback loop from data gathering to shared findings? Now also thinking ahead about the evaluation products that you want to use for decision making, like reports or tables or graphs or presentations, um, and what you want to share with stakeholders, thinking ahead about that can really help you prioritize your analysis activities to analysis that's most relevant and meaningful. So in our secondary transition example, the SCA staff plan to use the results to inform their statewide transition services planning. They know that 
it will be informative to those that are implementing and those that are not implementing in terms of the association between framework implementation and post-school success. You know, for those that are implementing, sharing results will help them see that difference that it's making, and, and those that are not using the framework uh, can learn about a, a, a potential uh, positive approach. The SCA staff will share results, for example, with educational regional leadership team, with, with the pilot educational regions, um, and with their uh, special ed state advisory panel. They may want to develop some kind of user-friendly graphic or chart to include in a quarterly, a quarterly newsletter to their special education directors, for example, to disseminate their findings in that way. This has just taken us through one example of how an SEA may enact the four key components of the evaluation process to inform their secondary transition services. I want to share one more example, but this time all the way through and on a very different topic. In this example, example two, a state's lead agency has revised its individualized family service plan handbook and related guidance. So this is not a, about professional development towards implementation of new practices. This is about revised guidance to inform service provision. Something very different, but something that happens all the time at the state level. But rather than leaving it there at revising their handbook and their guidance, the staff determine that the outputs that they expect to see is that the handbook and the guidance are completed and disseminated to local agencies to guide their IFSP development. And the, the staff believe that use of this guidance will support IFSPs with increasingly high-quality, functional, family-centered outcomes, activities, and strategies. This is the why, the reason behind their decision to, to, for that activity. So what does the lead agency want to know about this change that they've made to the guidance? Well, they decide that they want to know to what extent are service providers and service coordinators accessing and using the IFSP guidance. And they also want to know what impact the guidance has had on the quality of IFSP outcomes, activities, and strategies. Those are their evaluation questions. To answer these questions, they're going to collect and analyze data. The agency staff collects data on provider use of the guidance, perhaps through website statistics or a survey of providers. They take a sample of IFSPs before and after the revised guidance. And they look at data from IFSP quality rubrics that are collected on these samples. They examine the data that they collect, determining the extent of use of the guidance via those website stats or survey questions that we talked about. They compare pre and post IFSP quality based on the rubric. And they examine differences in quality, functionality, and family-centeredness of the IFSPs, looking at both before and after their revised guidance. They want to make use of their learning and they want to share. So they use the results to inform their state Part C program guidance development. They also know that the results can inform the work of local programs and local interagency coordinating councils uh, to learn about use of the guidance. They explicitly want to share with their state advisory panel, with state and local interagency coordinating councils. And they also want to develop some kind of user-friendly synopsis to share in a family newsletter of the Parent Training and Information Center.
what I've given you here is a second example of how an agency may go through each of the four key components of the evaluation process in order to inform an activity and support their intended results. It's a lot of information, but I'm going to challenge you to put it into practice. So now that we've gone through these four key components with these couple of examples, I'd like you to think about how the evaluation process could serve as a learning tool in your own state, in your own situation. So we'll go through each of the four key components, kind of one at a time. And I'd like you to share your ideas by using the chat box. Um, please just remember to send to all participants so that everyone can see uh, what, you are, what you are sharing. So first, think of an activity, a policy, a program that your state is implementing and a, the result that you expect it to have. This can be something that you plan on doing. This can be something that exists. It can be a policy, a program, a procedure, anything. And it does not have to be in complete sentences. We'll give you just a minute to share. If you don't, I'm going to have to come up with another example, which is fine. I'm happy to do so. I'll pose a question. Anyone out there launching a new data system? Maybe the state in which you're engaged is developing a new system. Perhaps you've updated a data dictionary. Maybe you're trying to increase your local agency's or district level access to data. That would be an example of an activity. It can be large, it can be small and focused. Moving from that activity, let's just say, oh, I see Karen entered something. So let's take one example of a data system. We'll continue that, but we'll also use the example that Karen Joyce has shared. All right, we'll start with Karen's. Karen has expressed an ed benefit training. They expect that the training is going to result in more effectively written IEPs. Excellent. And that result it will be better educational outcomes for students with disabilities. Aha, and she's already identified some data sources operationalizing that, measured by assessment scores, graduation rates, transition planning, for example. Okay, excellent. So the activity that she's identified is the ed benefit training. The intended outcome is more effectively written IEPs and subsequently better educational outcomes for students. Great. So what do you want to know about that? What would be a question for you, either about the Ed Benefit training or if anyone else wants to pipe in? What, would you, what, what kind of evaluation question would you form? What is a question that you would want to answer about that activity, about that new program? Maybe a question about how it's going, 
maybe a question about the result that it's had. looking at those expected outcomes, I would want to know if the training is occurring as intended. I would want to know if the IEPs were being written more effectively. And I might want to know, depending upon the data that I have access to, if better educational outcomes for students could be associated with those improved IEP. Now, Karen has identified already, through her intended outcomes, some key data sources that she would want to collect and examine. Excellent. Is Ed Benefit training effective in writing more effective IEPs? And is this sustained? Great. So she has some specific data sources that she's going to be able to point to. Alignment between goals in various years, for example. So the IEPs themselves, samples perhaps of the IEPs, are definitely going to be a data source. And how to look at this as being sustained. Does she have assessment scores? Does she have graduation rates, transition planning, for example, that she can associate to these IEPs and perhaps link them by quality? So she might look at the IEPs. Um, she may analyze. I'm wondering, Karen, do you have a process already in your state that you use to examine or analyze the quality of IEPs? For example, is there some kind of rubric that you use? The IEPs could be examined via some kind of rubric in that manner. Excellent. She says, no, we're just starting the Ed Benefit training, and we'll use that template. Great. So she's thinking about incorporating her intended outcomes from the very beginning. They're just starting the training, and she's already thinking about how will, what are her intended outcomes, and now what are the data that will be available, what are the questions that she's going to ask, what are the data that she's going to use, how she will analyze it. Tanya's asked, is the training going to improve parent participation as well as student outcomes? Great, that might be a part of the intended outcome, and that could be a related evaluation question that a state might be interested in. So what could you then do with this information? Let's say you gather information on the training, and you find that uh, indeed, the training is actually resulting in more effective IEPs, that there's better alignment than various goals, et cetera. Perhaps you even find that parent improvement has, uh, parent uh, participation has in, improved. What could you do with those evaluation findings? How would you use them, and who would be important to share them with? Karen has responded to Tanya that she doesn't think that the Ed Benefit Program is necessarily designed to improve parent participation, but maybe it would be an unintended outcome.
So who might Karen share these evaluation results with? Who, would, who are the important stakeholders? The people who received the training. Okay, great. So those that are involved in the training. Excellent. The team themselves will use the information to assess the interventions as one example. They may share with superintendents, with teachers, both general education and special education parents. Great. So many important stakeholders that would be interested in knowing if the Ed Benefit training resulted in more effectively written IEPs, not only would they be used for their internal program planning, but also to disseminate and to share with those interested parties. Great, well done. Ah, so Karen notes that sharing using data visualization is a plan to allow easy understandability of results in reports and perhaps verbally. Okay, so perhaps some oral sharing, it sounds like. Great, a wonderful example of going through the four key components really all within the purview and the understanding and the sort of organizational authority of, of the team that Karen is on. Great. Does anyone else want to offer any example further before we sort of continue with some final thoughts? I truly appreciate showing this example all the way through. I think that's very helpful. Okay, I'll continue. And if anyone has anything else to share, please feel free to send to all participants. I do want to say that I think that that really is a great example of how to apply the very basic components for informing services and for supporting results in, in your state. So I appreciate that. That's a, a way that um, you really showed you can leverage data that you uh, already collect to target your area of improvement and, and to make decisions about your planning, which of course affects resource allocation. Um, and to, you know, ultimately support your improved results, which is your goal. I just want to give a few um, tips for good measure um, to really help you make the most out of the evaluation process. This really is at the high level, but they're just kind of um, what I'm calling here tips for good measure. Um, first of all, plan it. Um, if you don't plan for it, it, it won't happen. Um, uh, Karen was at the, is there at the beginning of their Ed Benefit training, planning through these evaluation component steps now will really ensure that um, they learn all that they can from their efforts. Um, identify roles and responsibilities. The, the people that are responsible for planning and conducting these, these activities that are described here truly are the most important resources that you have. So identify who will do what. Even if you're working with an external evaluator, it's really important that you specify roles that your program staff or stakeholders will have. Um, they may be coordinating activities or collecting or supplying data or even participating in the analysis and review of data um, and results. 
Um, third, create a schedule. If you develop a realistic detailed timeline, um, that is uh, truly important to implementing evaluation effectively. Um, it's not only useful for you, but it serves as a communication tool for stakeholders who may be involved in or even just invested in the evaluation activities. Um, again, if you are working with someone, an external evaluator, require a schedule that allows you to have access to data along the way with time to be able to review it and use it to inform your ongoing decisions. Fourth, um, integrate evaluation into your program, as we've seen in these examples. Um, design activities with evaluation in mind from the outset um, so that you can think about the kinds of data that you'll need and build that into the plan. Integrating evaluation process in this way can really help you build um, a culture of uh, data use where staff and stakeholders are using data as part of just a regular practice. the effect of your resources, you know, revisit your evaluation activities and see how effective they are at sort of serving your purpose for learning. Your, you know, the data that you are collecting, are you still collecting the right information? Is it answering your questions? And just remember that a strong evaluation is really one that is appropriate to the data that you have it provides the necessary information to answer your questions, and it can be implemented using the resources available to you. And then lastly, just tailor your evaluation activities to your program, but build on existing evaluation knowledge and the many, many resources that are available to you. you know, this presentation truly just scratched the surface by presenting evaluation as a fundamental learning tool within results-driven accountability and framed evaluation under the four key components. But there are many, many resources available that guide you in how to actually put this process into action. Um, some, a couple that I just wanted to point out on the IDC website, evaluation resources, simply putting evaluation to the search box under resources will bring up many tools. Uh, a couple that I've noted here uh, may be most relevant to the general concept of the basic steps of evaluation, but there are many things there. Um, there are several National Technical Assistance Centers um, that offer uh, much information in this area. Of course, if you have any questions on the, this presentation or if you're interested in wanting some tips to learn more about how to apply and integrate evaluation process into your state, then you please feel free to contact me directly. That's my email. For some general information, um, here is our IDC website address. We're on Twitter. We're on LinkedIn. And I just want to say thank you to the Office of uh, Special Education Programs for supporting the work. And um, also thank you for your time today. Um, and I want to mention that following um, this uh, presentation, you'll get an email that requests your feedback on the webinar through um, a brief survey, and please let me know if I achieved my uh, intended outcomes this afternoon, um, if I provided you with um, an increased understanding of the basic components of evaluation, and if I supported an opportunity for you to consider evaluation as a tool for informing the services in your state and supporting results for children and youth with disabilities and their families. And as a final note, a reminder that the presentation will be posted and the recording on the IDC website soon. Okay, so thank you all very much. 
and have a great rest of your afternoon.